Hello my friends. Um, here I am at home and I'm recording this week's sermon. And uh, I know we're living in some very unusual circumstances right now, as I'm sure I don't have to tell you. And it's affecting all of us differently and people are reacting to it differently. Um, as I sometimes do go out, uh, I have to take special precautions, but I drive around sometimes just to get some fresh air. And I notice that there are still people, uh, you know, uh, some people are taking it seriously and some are not. I'm glad to see that a lot of our stores are starting something that can uh, uh, keep us safe uh, from each other, the social distancing and things like that. And I, I commend that. I, I know from stories that I'm hearing in the news that there are a lot of people in this country that don't seem to be taking it too seriously or are convinced it's some sort of hoax or trick. And uh, I, I don't know. I hear some disturbing things. Uh, the one thing I, I would say is regarding your own health, and I'm, you know, I'm saying this heartfeltly, I would not listen to politicians or uh, corporations. I would listen to doctors and healthcare experts. That's who I'm going to listen to. Uh, there's even been talk in the last day or so that certain number of us ought to be willing to sacrifice our very lives to save the stock market. There are a lot of things, well, there are things in this life that I would sacrifice my life for, but the stock market is not one of them. And I would advise you to not do the same. <laughs> but we all have to make our own choices about this. Some of us are going through a more difficult time than others, and I understand that. But um, this is a potentially devastating thing that's happening. Uh, and lives are at stake. And it may not be yours, but it may be somebody you know. So, having said all that, I will say one other thing, too. Um, I sort of made the decision that I will not dwell on uh, these events too much in any of my sermons. We get enough of that in the media. Um, the sermons will be pretty much about the text and the meaning of the text. And uh, hopefully... Uh, there is insight and wisdom in that enough without um, bringing too much of um, those events, the current crisis, into this. That may change as time goes by, but for right now, uh, I'm going to try that. So, we're going to prepare here. Today's reading is Psalm 23, a very well-known psalm. Uh, the version that I'm going to read is a somewhat updated uh, version in language that I like very much, and I hope you appreciate it too. Psalm 23. You, God, are my shepherd, I shall not want. You let me rest in fields of green grass. You lead me to streams of peaceful water. You refresh my life. You are true to your name and lead me along the right paths. I may walk through valleys as dark as death, but I won't be afraid. You are with me. Your shepherd's rod makes me feel safe. You treat me to a feast while my enemies watch. You honor me as your guest and fill my cup until it overflows. Your kindness and love will always be with me each day of my life and I will live forever in your house, O oh God. And may God speak to us through these verses today. My friends, as I said, the 23rd Psalm is one of the best-known passages from Scripture, one of the most beloved. Many people, young and old, can even recite it from heart. Many turn to it for comfort and hope, especially in times of confusion or fear, grief or loss. It's a somewhat rare funeral that does not include this psalm. I include it in my graveside uh, services. 
And that's probably because of the verses about walking through the valley of death's shadow or some version on that. The reassurance that we never walk that valley alone. Now, aside from any power that this psalm may have for preparing us for death, the psalm also has the power to prepare us for life. And the kind of life we live now is actually what prepares us for this life's end. And it determines how we will face something like death. After all, death is only part of life, like birth. It's part of the eternal cycle of existence. And we believe that death is not the end of our existence. But between birth and death is the challenge of how we will live. Now, in 15 beautiful lines, this ancient poem offers us an answer to that challenge. It invites us to let God shepherd us, guide us, through this journey called life. Life is, after all, a journey. Now, I used to believe, at one point, that I would reach this point in my life when everything would come together. Job, family, what I think and believe about things. All these things would finally gel into one package, in a sense, and my real life, so to speak, would finally begin. Now, I remember thinking, well, that'll happen when I'm 25. Well, then I thought maybe 30. That's a nice round number. Then I thought maybe 40. Now, eventually, as most of you probably have, I realized that life isn't really like that. Day by day, moment by moment, this is real life. And it keeps zigzagging. It turns this way and that. And sometimes it even goes down wrong turns and dead ends. And then maybe back again. The whole journey is life. And we keep changing and growing, experiencing new things along the way. Life is full of opportunities and possibilities and choices. Some good, some bad. And along the way, our character is shaped. The real question that we all face is not, where am I going, but who am I becoming? Now, some spiritual writers claim that the meaning of life is what they call soul-making. Our souls are in a continual process of being formed. One writer says, there is an unfinished quality about human beings that includes both the tragic and the glorious dimensions of human experience. If we did not feel at least a little unfinished, we would never have a sense of longing for anything, would we? A yearning, a craving for anything. We wouldn't need or want anything. We wouldn't be looking for things like meaning or fulfillment. But our souls do long for those things, crave those things, don't they? We long for love, for happiness, for security. And we have spiritual longings, too. That our existence has significance, that there is a deeper dimension to this ordinary world, that death is not final. Now, these spiritual longings, Aren't they one of the reasons, at least, that we come to church, that we're religious people? These longings are why we hope, they're why we pray, they're why we put faith in something as invisible and intangible as God. We feel somehow unfinished, and we want God to finish us, to complete us. Now, our life journey is this soul-making process. Each path that we choose, each experience that we go through, each decision that we make, changes us in some way. Maybe in big, obvious ways, maybe even in small, subtle ways we may not even be aware of. Some paths that we choose change us for the better. Some paths we choose change us for the worse. That means that there must be right paths and wrong paths. 
The poet of the psalm tells us that God knows all the right paths. You are true to your name, O God, and lead me along the right paths. In other words, it is God's nature only to lead us in the right way. Otherwise, God would not be God. But when we think about right and wrong, good or bad, better or worse, that implies a kind of perspective. Now, our perspective as human beings about what might seem a right path may not always be God's perspective. I once read an article that said that sheep have very weak eyes and that they really can't see much more than 10 or 15 yards ahead of them. Well, people have limited vision too. We can only see so far ahead in our lives. That's why we often pick the shortest and quickest route. But short and quick is not always the best way. The shepherd, for example, in ancient times, the shepherd may know that there's a good grazing field that's only one straight mile ahead. But maybe that straight mile is dangerous. Maybe along that straight mile there is wild animals or cattle rustlers. So the shepherd, knowing this, decides to take a longer, safer route. And even though it's longer, that would be the right route, wouldn't it? Now, sometimes that longer, more difficult route is better or wiser. I remember when I was in school, and boy, I'm really going to date myself here, my math teachers refused to let us use calculators to solve equations. But why, why not? Why couldn't we use them? Why should I struggle over math when this little machine could just do it for me? Now, eventually, I realized that my teachers were not really interested in just me getting the right answer. They were really more interested in teaching me how to use my brain to think things through. A shortcut would not help us learn. Now, in similar fashion, we should not try to find moral or spiritual shortcuts either. For example, I think we'd all agree that it's better to earn money the honest way, even if it's harder, than to steal it. I mean, you know, we all know stealing's wrong, right? Any time that we lie, cheat, or steal, we are taking a moral shortcut. We might get what we want, but does that make it right? Now, you might think, too, about relationships. They take time and effort. We have to work at our relationships if we want them to deepen or last. We have to be willing to compromise. We struggle through problems together. And then there's our spiritual life. Real growth and real maturity come through effort, even struggle. And if we keep taking shortcuts to avoid struggles, we're probably not going to grow very much. And we might wind up with a somewhat weak and shallow spirituality. Now, our culture encourages us to believe that everything should come quickly and easily. Life is fast-paced in this country. We always seem to be busy and in a hurry. But there is usually a price to pay for pushing ourselves too hard. Again, think of this ancient shepherd. If the shepherd did not let the flock stop to rest now and then, if he just hurried them from one destination to another, he might not wind up with much of a flock when he gets there. The price that we busy, fast-paced humans pay is usually stress and anxiety and exhaustion. And these can damage our physical and mental health. The message of the psalm, even, of this psalm, is that we need to slow down sometimes and stop just for our own well-being. We need to rest. We need to enjoy life and the beauty of creation. Notice what the poet says in Psalm 23. God lets me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside peaceful waters, still waters, in one translation. God knows that we need those things for our spiritual health, too. 
Now, I know that sometimes I just need to go for a walk in the woods or go sit by the lake out at Sally Buffalo. I need to reconnect with God's good creation. We are part of creation after all. We are made of the same stuff as trees and lakes and grass and earth. We are born and we live and we die as part of nature. And I believe that there is something within each one of us that draws us to experience nature. And I also believe that we can experience God in fresh ways, different ways in nature, because God's Spirit fills all of creation. And God certainly does not just live only in church buildings. And that's an important lesson to remember, too, a reminder. The church is not that building that we can't go in right now. That is not the church. We are the church. Right now, we are being the church. I'm communicating with you. You're responding. This is the church. We will continue. And eventually, we will get to go back to our beloved sanctuary, but again, we can find God anywhere. Shut up in our houses, in a walk at the park, etc. You know, there's a story I came across about a young boy who started spending hours every day out wandering in the woods near his home. And his father was curious why his son loved those woods so much, why he kept going out there. So he finally asked him, why do you go out there so often? And the boy said, I go there to find God. Well, said the father, a little surprised by that answer. I'm glad you're looking for God, but, you know, God is everywhere, not just out there in the woods. Don't you know God is the same everywhere? And the boy said, yes, I know God is the same everywhere, but I'm not. I think that's an important lesson. Sometimes we need a change of environment to think differently, feel differently, even to uh, feel differently about God. And the calm and quiet of nature can help us. Most religions believe that the earth reflects the glory of God. Henry David Thoreau once said, My profession is always to be alert to find God in nature. Anthony of the Desert, an early Christian monk, said, My book is is the nature of created things, and any time I wish to read the words of God, the book is before me. The Buddha said, if you wish to know the divine, feel the wind on your face and the warm sun on your hand. Now going back to Psalm 23, who does not love that image in the psalm of God leading the poet to grassy fields and peaceful waters? I believe God calls us to these quiet, calming places for our own good and for the good of our relationship with God. But I also think that the psalmist is referring to spiritual waters, to the calm, quiet waters of prayer, meditation, solitude. We all have plenty of solitude right now. It's a good chance to explore some of these new... <laughs> avenues of relating to God. You know, if we're just constantly running on the treadmill without a break, if we're working ourselves into the ground, if we don't spend any time alone with our souls, we are harming our spiritual health. And I think one of the lessons that a lot of us may learn from this enforced solitude. I know that there are people out there who do not like to be alone with themselves. It's difficult, and it may even be a little challenging, and it may even be a little frightening. Um, some of, sometimes people don't like to go too far below the surface, and they seek distraction. Let's go out to the movies. Let's go out to dinner. Let's go out to do this. Let's go do that. Because otherwise, I'm going to sit in my house and go inward and think. And we may not always want to do that. And my friends, do we take the time to let the spiritual waters within us settle down and be still? 
There's an ancient Taoist proverb that says that no one can make muddy water clear by shaking it or stirring it. But if you let the water remain still, the mud will gradually settle to the bottom and the water will clear itself. Now, our spiritual water can get muddy too. And sometimes we just have to be still so that the mud will settle and the water will clear. Do we take time out of each day to just step out of the hustle and bustle, to just be still and know that God is God? to create a stillness within ourselves. It is in that kind of clear stillness that we can hear God perhaps better, that we can experience God's presence a little closer. Now God knows that we need these things on this sometimes difficult journey of life. These are the things that can refresh us and restore our souls when our souls grow weary. They can give us strength and help us endure, even over the roughest terrain or through the darkest valleys. They can help us find a peace and a contentment we might otherwise miss out on. The poet of the psalm says that God prepares a feast for him in the presence of his enemies. And perhaps one way to understand that is to say that by following God as our shepherd, we can experience a kind of life that other people who choose not to follow God can't comprehend and can't have for themselves. Life like an abundant feast full of meaning and purpose and beauty and joy rather than emptiness and exhaustion. The 23rd Psalm does not promise that bad things will not happen to us or that we will never suffer. It does not promise to change this world, but it does offer us a path on how to walk through this world, a path that can change us and how we live in this world. Amen. God bless to all of you. Please take care of yourselves. You're in my prayers always. I also wanted to mention, I meant to mention this at the beginning, but I am in the process of making phone calls to as many of our people as I can. Um, if I haven't got to you yet, please just be patient, and I will do my best. And it's one way for us to stay connected. There are also, uh, a, there's a possibility, if we can get enough people willing and able, that we can uh, start up a Bible study online. Uh, unfortunately, I'm finding that a lot of our people, especially some of our older folks, are just simply not computer people and uh, would not be able to participate very much. But it may be that you know we can still try something with it. So I'll try to keep you posted. I'm so grateful to everyone who's been kind and helpful during this time. Um, and uh, again... I'm trusting in God for all of us, that no matter what happens, God is with us. God gives us strength and hope. God gives us purpose and meaning. And that's all we really need to hold on to at a time like this. Goodbye.